Garage. Hello everyone, welcome to the second episode of Automotive Aerodynamics with Gray. Today we're going to be talking about pop-up headlights. Now this is an idea I got from one of the YouTube comments in my first episode, and I thought it'd be really cool to look at the differences in the flow features between the older style pop-up headlight, which is also known as a hidden headlamp, and the newer style integrated aerodynamic headlamp. Now it's kind of a shame that these pop-up headlights have disappeared from modern car design. And that's due to a number of different reasons. Um, one of the most pressing reasons is the aerodynamic penalty you pay for having this style of design. And so we're going to go through a few of those discussions and arguments. Um, and it's kind of, kind of a shame. These pop-up headlights give a human-like quality to the car with the ability to open and close that's sort of lost on newer car designs. Um, it almost gives the car a mood. So when you have this pop-up headlight fully opened, it makes the car look very awake, very cheerful, very happy. Um, anyone looking at an older Miata with their headlights up can't say that car looks cheerful and happy. Um, obviously when it's fully closed, it's asleep. And some people, myself included, have done a modification called the lazy eye modification, where you can close the headlights to different levels, giving the car sort of a drowsy factor. So we're going to discuss some of the reasons why these headlights have disappeared and we're going to be approaching this from an aerodynamic perspective. And through this discussion we'll learn together and hopefully uh, you can judge whether um, you still like these uh, pop-up headlights or you want to move to a more integrated design and reap those benefits aerodynamically. First things first, let's talk about the history of pop-up headlamps. They first appeared on the Cord 810 in 1936. There was supposedly an aerodynamic advantage in that they could be hidden away into the bodywork, giving a flush appearance and supposedly a reduction in drag. Now whether or not this reduction was actually achievable or effective is a little bit under debate. Uh, if we look at the seminal publication on drag by Herner, he states a drag increased for fixed headlamps on 1930s, 1940s era's cars to be about 8 to 12%. So these are not for pop-up headlamps, these are for those fixed external headlamps. So if we think, you know, those give about 8 to 12% increase in drag, if we hide those away into the bodywork, we'd probably get some of those back. Uh, whether or not you get the actual 8 to 12% is a little bit iffy. Uh, these cars uh, had a lot of drag, more than twice as much as today's uh, vehicles. Moving on, in the 1970s there was introduced a headlight height requirement. And this was higher than manufacturers wanted for low nose sports cars. They didn't want to sacrifice the handling and aesthetic qualities of a low nose sports car by having to raise the ride height uh, to satisfy this height requirement. So to get around this, they installed pop-up headlights. So you could keep that low nose for that aesthetic and handling benefits, and you could still satisfy that height requirement by having those headlights pop up. So many different cars have gone with this implementation over the years. We can think of numerous different cars, Corvettes, Ferraris, the Testarossa, one of my favorite cars. Uh, a lot of Japanese sports cars, things that we've tested like the MR2, the RX-7, uh, Miatas, AE86, uh, Porsches, you name it. Throughout the years, many different cars have used pop-up headlights. In addition to the headlight height requirement, there are new rules regarding the design of deformable front ends for pedestrian crash safety, which make employing pop-up headlights very tricky. So technically they're still legal, it's just very tricky to employ them on modern vehicle designs. And this is due to these new stricter rules, um, having a space to in include that pop-up headlight and the opening mechanism, the closing mechanism. There's just not enough space while still having that deformable front end and uh, in addition, one of the interesting rules is that if you employ a pop-up headlight on a modern design, if it malfunctions, if that opening mal uh, mechanism malfunctions, the headlights must be able to be opened without any tools. This is a tricky design requirement for the engineer, and so most modern cars have just abandoned them and gone with integrated headlights. Uh, the last production modern car to have this was the Corvette C5 in 2004-2005. And we'll be talking about this a little bit more uh, a little bit later. 
By far, the biggest drawback of employing pop-up headlights on a modern car design is the aerodynamic drag penalty that you suffer when those headlights are up. Um, there's a really great design study that uh, I've put together based on some wind tunnel tests of this, the whole series of Corvettes uh, from the C1 all the way to the C6. And I've used this Corvette because there's been so many different design iterations um, and many of them have actually used pop-up headlights. Like I said before, the last production modern car to have one was the Corvette C5. So by analyzing the change in drag values uh, for the different series of Corvettes and looking at what type of headlights they use is really uh, elucidating in terms of determining the drag penalty you pay for these pop-up headlights. Um, so these results are based on some wind tunnel tests done by superchevy.com. Um, the article was kind of poorly written, so a few of the numbers I'm a little bit uncertain about. Um, just based on the way the article was worded and written, um, a few of the numbers are a little bit under question. Um, and also just take into account that this was done in not a manufacturing wind tunnel, this was done in sort of a uh, company wind tunnel, so the results might not be 100% accurate in terms of the actual values. But what will be accurate is the change in values. So we're looking at the difference in drag, not the absolute values. And what we want to look at is how much drag is increased when we put those pop-up headlights up. So let's move on to that now, that design study, and look at the different generations of Corvettes. The results of the aerodynamic testing are presented here. Where on the horizontal axis we have the different Corvette models, C1 to C6, and on the vertical axis we have the drag values. It is first important to look at how they've presented the drag. Drag is a force, and it is equal to Q times CD times A, where Q is the dynamic pressure and represents the flow velocity. CD is the drag coefficient and represents the aerodynamic efficiency of the shape. A is the frontal area of the vehicle in feet squared. So what they presented here is CD times A, where CD is a non-dimensional number times A, which is feet squared, resulting in a value called the drag factor with dimensions feet squared. They did this because they measured the drag forces and then they divided by their flow speed, Q, resulting in CD times A, their drag factors. Let's now look at the first Corvette, the C1. This Corvette had fixed headlights and naturally has the highest drag being the oldest of the Corvettes. The C2 was the first Corvette to use pop-up headlights. Although because the headlights are fairly integrated into the bodywork, the increase in drag is only 5.5%. We can see from the smoke flow visualizations that flow separation occurs above the headlights and this is what results in the increase in drag. The C3 Corvette had the largest pop-up headlights of any Corvette, and therefore had the largest drag increase, 10.7%. This is fairly significant, and is due to the fact that the pop-up headlights protrude so far away from the bodywork. The C4 Corvette also had pop-up headlights, but they were smaller in size than those of the C3, and therefore had a smaller drag increase, only 7.5%. The C5 Corvette was the last Corvette to have pop-up headlights. Now this is the only value from the wind tunnel test that's a little bit iffy, so I had to do a little bit extra research to try and determine this value. So 9.1% is an, as a guess, an estimated guess, based on the size and drag values for the Corvette. The C6 Corvette was the first Corvette to move to integrated modern aero headlights. Now this Corvette obviously has the lowest drag, being the newest Corvette, excluding the C7, which I know is out, but I haven't analyzed here. And we can see here that there's no penalty with the headlights. That's because the headlights are fully integrated into the bodywork. So the drag value is very similar to the C5 with the headlights down. In conclusion, from this analysis, we can see that Corvettes have been getting progressively more aerodynamic over the years and that headlights, in particular pop-up headlights, incur an additional drag penalty, somewhere between 5 to 11%, which is in line with what Herner said at 8 to 12% for those older style cars. 
So what we can see here is that the pop-up headlights do incur a significant drag penalty when they're deployed. And this is why modern car designs just can't use them anymore. They have to move to the integrated aero headlights to not have that drag penalty. Now that we've discussed the history of pop-up headlights and done a design study on the Corvette, let's get into the meat and potatoes here and look at some flow visualizations and try and understand why do pop-up headlights create so much drag? You know, five to 10% is very significant for fuel economy, for top speed. And so let's look at what flow structures and what is it about pop-up headlights that are, is causing so much drag? So to do this, I had to choose a car for a design study. Now I'm doing some work with a colleague on a Commodore VH. Now this is an older sedan that he's using for racing. And so I'm doing some other tests for him on that. And I thought, you know what, this is a pretty good shape to look at pop-up headlights. Now the original car didn't come with pop-up headlights. It had the integrated headlight design. And so I started with that, looking at the flow around the vehicle with the integrated headlights. And then I added some pop-up headlights and I used the dimensions and the aspect ratio for the Toyota MR2, the Mark I, because I could actually physically measure it on my own vehicle. I scaled up the headlights a little bit from the actual sizes so that we could look at the flow structures in more detail. Uh, the model still is fairly small. I made a 3D drawing of the model and then I 3D printed it here in the lab and I have it here actually. And so um, tested this in the wind tunnel with and without the pop-up headlights installed, looking at some flow visualizations and it really clearly shows why the pop-up headlights create so much drag. I also wanted to just think about the flow before actually putting the model in the water channel. It's a good idea before getting started on something to think about what you expect the result to be, um, just sort of as a thought experiment. So I drew up the geometry and thought, you know, what will this flow structure look like? What is most likely going to happen? And so I did a little quick sketch I have here um, showing that I thought there would be flow separation on all edges around the pop-up headlight. And I did this before doing any tests, just as a, as a quick thought experiment, as an exercise, and I wanted to compare it to my results. So keep this in mind, and you're going to see just how closely uh, my thought experiment came to the actual result. And we're going to talk about what parts of the geometry and why this is causing full flow separation that uh, and cause that drag increase. We begin by looking at the flow over the front hood of the vehicle with no pop-up headlights. So this is a bird's eye view looking from the top down on the front hood and the beginning of the windshield. As we can see, the flow moves smoothly around the front hood. We can see some bubbles being trapped on the surface, and this is likely due to a small separation bubble that exists on the front hood. But it's not visible here because it's so small. The key point here is to notice that the flow lines are fairly smooth. We now look at the flow with a pulsed hydrogen bubble sheet. What we can see here is again, the flow moves smoothly around the front hood, but what we notice is that there's a vortex forming at the front hood windshield junction. This is the commonly occurring junction vortex. Let's now slow down the frame rate and look at how the flow moves around the front hood. You can see again it moves smoothly around, although there may be some separation along the sides near the front of the windshield. And again we see that windshield junction vortex. We now add the pop-up headlights. And again, these pop-up headlights are exaggerated in size to show the flow structures that are occurring. What we can see is that that originally smooth flow is now broken up into large areas of separation. These large separated wakes form behind each of the pop-up headlights. In this view, we see that the separation is occurring along the sides of the pop-up headlight. The flow is sped up in between the headlights and we don't see any windshield vortex. Let's now slow down the frame rate. Here again we can see that the bubbles approach the headlights and flow separation is occurring on both sides, the left and right of each of the pop-up headlights. 
This separation is occurring along the front edges. And this results in a large separated wake with recirculation, which is backflow, occurring behind each of the pop-up headlights. We now have continuous flow, and again we can see the same general behavior. The flow approaches the pop-up headlights and separates on both the left and right sides, right at the front edges. This forms a large separated wake with recirculation and backflow. Another feature that we can see is that the side flow is also affected. This is the flow along the side of the vehicle. Whereas before we saw possible separation near the front of the windshield, we now see it much sooner near the front of the car. So not only does the pop-up headlight affect the flow immediately behind it, but also along the side of the vehicle. Again, this effect may be exaggerated because of the sizes of the pop-up headlights have been increased to further show these flow structures. We now shift our viewpoint and look at the car from the side. This is the Commodore with a clean profile, no pop-up headlights. We can see the streamlines move smoothly around the vehicle, and there's some flow separation in the rear, but we're not going to focus on that today. What we're looking at is the flow around the front hood, which looks fairly clean. Let's take a closer look, and again we can see that it looks fairly clean. Although near the front nose, there's a sharp angle change with a possible separation. That's where we saw those bubbles accumulating on the front hood. Overall though, the flow is fairly smooth and it moves along the front hood and then over the front windshield. We now look at the flow with the pop-up headlights installed, and immediately one thing we can notice is that the flow along the front hood and front windshield is a little bit more unsteady. It seems to be moving around a little bit more, and this is likely due to the flow unsteadiness caused by the pop-up headlights. Let's now take a closer look as before. Again, we can see the flow between the pop-up headlights is slightly more unsteady, and this is likely due to the large separated regions occurring behind each of the pop-up headlights. If we pulse the hydrogen bubbles, one thing remains clear. It does look like we have a windshield junction vortex, as before, where initially we thought maybe because of the pop-up headlights that vortex had been eliminated, we can still see some recirculation in that junction region. So whether the vortex is the same size or the same shape is uncertain, but it seems to still exist. Because my wire producing hydrogen bubbles was along the center line of the vehicle, we couldn't see the flow along the top of the pop-up headlights. Now I couldn't easily move this wire, so instead what I did was take the, the pop-up headlights off and put a single one along the center line of the vehicle. So what we're looking at here is the flow around the top of the pop-up headlight and a few different things become really clear. One, we see massive separation over the top of the pop-up headlight. This creates a large separated zone in the vertical sense, whereas before we were looking at it in the horizontal sense. And we can see that recirculating flow and the backflow. Another cool feature is that we see a small recirculation at the front of the pop-up headlight. Let's slow things down a bit. So we can see the bubbles approaching the pop-up headlight. We get a small recirculation near the bottom front edge of the headlight. And at the top edge, the flow separates and forms a massive separation region behind the pop-up headlight. We get recirculating flow and backflow in this region. Now again, this, the size of this flow structure is exaggerated because the size of the pop-up headlights have been increased and I really wanted to exaggerate the flow structures here. If we now turn on constant bubbles, it becomes very clear the size of this recirculated region and the massive flow separation that occurs along the front edge of the pop-up headlight. Again, this is exaggerated because of the size of the pop-up headlight, but the general behavior will remain the same for the actual size, smaller pop-up headlight. What we can see here is that in the vertical plane, massive separation is occurring. And so when we combine this with the separation occurring along the horizontal plane, we get a three-dimensional picture of what's happening behind these pop-up headlights. If we now take a step back and look at the overall flow features, 
and compare it to the original sketch that I made on the thought experiment, we can see that I wasn't far off. In the horizontal sense, we get flow separation along the side edges of both pop-up headlights, and in the vertical sense, we get separation along the top edge. This creates a large three-dimensional flow separation with recirculation, and this is the reason why pop-up headlights create so much drag. So the final conclusion to this investigation is that pop-up headlights do produce a large amount of drag. 5 to 11 percent is significant when considering modern car design. And this is really why they've disappeared from modern designs. Uh, we don't really see them anymore, and that's kind of a shame. Uh, Pop-up headlights give a character to a car that the integrated aero headlights really don't have. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, I make these videos on my spare time, mostly on Friday nights or weekends. So if you could please like this video and subscribe if you haven't already done that. Um, that shows me that you guys like these videos and you want more. And that sort of motivates me to continue making videos. So please go ahead and do that if you haven't. And enjoy your weekend. Chris Garage.